Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Happy Friday. I know it's snowing out there, but uh, we're excited for uh, today's Grand Rounds. Um, I still want to thank everyone out there who's been helping out during this COVID uh, crisis. I think you guys have been true troopers in helping our patients and uh, really uh, keeping uh, Michigan Medicine afloat. Um, uh, I really appreciate that. And in tune with that, we have a fantastic grand rounds from uh, Joe Hall today, uh, one of our professors of internal medicine. Let me just tell you briefly about him. Uh, uh, Joel is uh, the Elizabeth Farron Collegiate Professor of the History of Medicine. Uh, he did his uh, MD at University of Chicago, his PhD at the University of uh, Pennsylvania in history, and he has been one of our uh, foremost medical historians uh, here in the department. Uh, he uh, has a joint uh, appointment with in the, the LSNA uh, in the Department of History, and he's written very important uh, monographs, uh, books, and uh, papers on some of the most storied uh, stories in uh, the history of medicine. And uh, today, I, uh, we have an exciting uh, topic, uh, and this is uh, very dear to our heart because this is one of the uh, ways that we're preventing uh, the spread of COVID-19, and that is washing our hands. And how that came about, I think uh, Dr. Howell will uh, tell us uh, uh, how that uh, came about. Um, uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Joel, for uh, providing Grand Rounds today, and I look forward to your presentation. So take it away. Thank you very much, John. As I speak here in my little office to all of you all around the county, the state, maybe the world, these, these are turbulent and uncertain times, that's for sure. But there's some things that we know are true, that we know for sure are true. And one of them is that the sun is going to come up every morning. We know that we're always going to get a snowstorm in April sometime in Ann Arbor. And we also know that it's true that you really, really ought to wash your hands. And why should you wash your hands? I'm going to start by noting that hand washing isn't only about medicine and germs. It's long been an activity fraught with symbolic meaning. Think about Shakespeare's play Macbeth, and Lady Macbeth walks around compulsively washing her hands, saying, out, damn spot, out. What she's doing is trying to cleanse her conscience, uh, her guilty conscience, for help to, helping to murder King Duncan. And even today, studies have shown that people who are thinking about unethical acts or have performed unethical acts tend to wash their hands more often than others. Hand washing is also a symbolic part of many religions, including the three great Abrahamic traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But these are internal medicine grand rounds, and we strongly, deeply believe that hand washing is more than simply a religious or a moral gesture. Hand washing, we believe, saves lives. We believe it's a central part of disease prevention in many contexts for clinical care in general, and for addressing the COVID pandemic in particular. Why? Where did that idea come from? I'm gonna take the next 45 minutes to ask how and why and when we came to believe that washing your hands would save lives. I think this is a fascinating story. It's one of life, death, discovery. It's a story of health services research, of translational research, and a tale of when and how good science can help make good policy. It's also a story of why sometimes good science does not make good policy. Spoiler alert, one impediment can be politics, both big P and little p politics. This is also a story about a man, Ignaz Semmelweis. 16 years ago, I gave a similar grand rounds to this department about Semmelweis, but new material has emerged since then, material that will help us unpack the thought process that led to this important discovery. Semmelweis, of course, is a familiar name. He was even on the Google homepage not long ago. And I hope to show you how this simple story that's often told is actually a good deal more complex and that that complexity actually makes the story more useful for today's practitioners. 
On first glance, this may seem to be a different kind of a grand rounds than the usual. But I would argue that it's actually quite similar in many ways. We're going to be talking about experiments. We're going to be talking about the very latest tools to advance medical science. Only we'll be talking about tools and ideas from the 19th century. At the end of the talk, I'm going to say a few words about newer ideas and approaches to hand washing, including work from this institution. I also want to point out the practical value of this story that goes well beyond the specific topic of hand washing and actually is applicable to literally everything that we do. For everything that we believe is true, every fact, even the seemingly most obvious facts, like the sun comes up in the east or you should wash your hands, all these truths that you use in your everyday life, whatever you do, had to be invented. They were once new. Someone somewhere at a particular time and a particular place had to come up with these ideas. So it was for hand washing. And in this case, the particular time was the 1840s and the particular place was the Vienna General Hospital, where a young clinician became aware of some particularly troubling data. But first we need to set the stage before we go to Vienna and, cons and consider the environment in which these ideas came into existence. We're gonna be talking about childbirth. And by the 1800s, medicine had made enormous advances in solving the key problems of childbirth. One of the problems was prolonged delivery, failure of delivery to progress. And this problem had been solved by the invention of forceps, which you see here hanging on the wall behind this rather grotesque man, midwife. These were the Chamberlain forceps. They were a family secret for many years. They became common knowledge by the 1730s. Now the outcome was not always good for the fetus. And there was often significant morbidity for the mother, but at least the mother would survive. Another problem was postpartum bleeding. This problem was solved by a fungus derived from rye wheat ergotamine which causes contraction of smooth muscles in the uterus and arteries, and is still used in medications today. But a big problem remained, childbed fever. This is the same as uh, corporal fever. This is a problem that was mentioned by Hippocrates. So the ancients knew about this. He described a fever with a chill while the abdomen becomes swollen. If you touch the patient, the whole body feels the pain of it, a burning sensation in the abdomen. The pulse is always weak, at times also quick, more rarely strong, but thin. And he concludes, it will probably prove fatal. This plague of young women was seen to be particularly pitiful. There is something, somebody wrote about childbed fever, there is something so touching in the death of a woman who has recently given birth to her child, something so mournful in the disappointment of cherished hopes, something so pitiful in the disordered condition of the newborn helpless creature forever deprived of those tender cares and caresses so necessary for it. Catastrophe. And finally, it is to women what war is to men. Like war, it cuts down the healthiest bravest and most essential part of the population. Like war, its victims are in the prime of their lives. So childbed fever was not only common, it was particularly problematic. This is the entrance to the Semmelweis Museum. We're gonna come back to this image from time to time. Mother and child would be rejoicing after their birth of the child, 24 to 36 hours, the woman would develop a fever, the pulse would go up, she developed horrible abdominal pain, delirium, malodorous discharge, rigors, and eventually. Leaving behind a motherless child if the child did not also die. It was not only the poor that suffered from this, the rich did as well. Obviously, people wondered about what caused childbed fever, and there were lots of different ideas. There was a lot of attention to atmospheric causes of death or disease, which were common in those days. Miasmas, bad air was seen as the cause of a disease. Other people looked to ancient ideas about the imbalance of humors, too much black bile, too little yellow bile. 
Other people looked at suppression of the normal discharge after birth, but there was no agreement on what caused the disease. Um, you don't necessarily need to understand the cause of a disease. Uh, it could have many different causes. You might wonder about how to treat it, but there was no agreement about that. Either. We're going to come back to childbed fever. Now I want to transition to the state of medical science in general in the 1840s. Just as it is today, there was no doubt in people's minds that medicine had made enormous progress in advancing fundamental scientific ideas about medicine. Those ideas were most prominently the notion of anatomic thinking, and it came, these ideas came out of a political disruption, the French Revolution. This is an example of polit political changes leading to changes in medical thought. The French Revolution led to the disruption of the medical and educational system in what was, at the time, the most powerful, the most advanced, the most sophisticated country in the world. The medical schools were torn down, they were closed, and then they were reopened under the revolutionary government. And this went along with a trend toward empiricism, with physicians drawing knowledge not from abstract theory, but from practical physical experience. And the way forward was thought to be clinical pathological correlation on hospital wards such as shown here. Physicians would go round on the hospital wards, they would examine the patients. When the patients died, they would go down to the morgue and they would do an autopsy and they would find out if their diagnosis had been correct. The autopsies, like the surgery, were done without rubber gloves, weren't invented. Every forward-looking medical school wanted to do that. They wanted to be like the Parisians. Americans did not have that opportunity. We did not have hospitals that could sustain this kind of work. So this is a map that was printed specifically for Americans going to post-revolutionary Paris that shows them the various hospitals located on the map that they might want to visit. So for one thing, the fact that they're printing this map tells you that lots of people saw Paris as important. The whole philosophy was the seats and causes of disease as determined by anatomy. This led to revolutions in medical thought and practice. And one of the revolutions is shown on the left here, and that's the stethoscope, invented by Lenek in the Parisian hospital. This was an incredible tool. It enables you to see inside the body, and then you could go and predict what you were going to find. You would examine the patient, say, I think I hear a right lower lobe problem, and then once they died, you would do the autopsy and see if you were right. But even more important, possibly, than the revolution of physical diagnosis was a revolution in the conceptualization of the disease. Remember, I talked about diseases thought to be caused by imbalances in humors, by bad air. This was a revolution that we've come to be very familiar with, the idea of anatomic thinking, the idea that disease is a lesion. It is a place here in the lawn, this right here. That's a problem. That's a disease. This cavity right here, that's the disease. So we take this very much for granted, but this was the hot new scientific idea that disease was localized and the idea that the basis of everything was the well-conducted dissection of the patient's cadaver. Medical schools all over the world took notice, including those in Vienna. Vienna at that time home to 430,000 people, including Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert. People flocked to the cities, flocked to the new industrialization. Many of the people who came to the cities were young women, <clears throat> often poorly educated, enticed by the allure of new industries, new factories, and different kinds of, of employment. They traveled from the countryside to large cities such as Vienna, and there they found work in factories or as domestics for affluent Viennese families. The Vienna General Hospital was built just outside the old fortifying walls of the city. The large hospital, 2,000 beds, the largest in Europe. It was based on an Enlightenment idea that the state ought to provide free medical care for the indigent. 
care for the poor and disaffected. It was built to allow for cross ventilation based on the atmospheric theory of disease. You can see that the walls allow windows that allow the breeze to, put, to flow through. And the maternity wing was originally built with 200 beds. Recall that hospital teaching was based on clinical pathological correlation. Uh, the hospital not only provided places to seat, but uh, places to teach, but also disposable bodies. And lots of people died. Not a coincidence that the maternity clinics for unmarried women were literally across the street from the state-run orphan. Finally, the last bit of stage setting I want to take up before we turn to Semmelweis and hand washing is the medical school. Medical teaching was in flux, much as it is today. There were two schools of thought. The old school represented the established order. They'd been in control since ancient times. They placed their faith in hierarchical social themes and thought the leaders should set the philosophical tone for the entire community. The new school adherents were radically anti-establishment, generally opposed to central powers, including their very own Austro-Hungarian empire. They valued rational thought over medieval musing, material observations over metaphysics, mathematical verities such as statistics over intuitive correlations. They longed for academic freedom, the ability to critically pursue their own intellectual theories. Such men were typically younger and more recently. The medical curriculum when Semmelweis got there had recently been revolutionized to be based on these new, more modern ideas. The Ministry of Education had issued a new imperative concerning anatomy based on the rapid advances in the Parisian hospitals. And it has it said that faculty members must integrate the dissection of the cadaver into all aspects of their curriculum. This is the morgue of the Vienna General Hospital. The instructors in obstetrics were told they must use the cadaver for teaching the mechanics of delivery and students had to spend a major part of their time dissecting the dead. The incumbent head of OBGYN didn't like this, either, so he quit. The new head of OBGYN was Johann Klein, 34 years old, charming, politically connected. In addition to overseeing the care of indigent women, he also ran a private ward for the wealthy and the politically connected. He was responsible for pushing the new medicine and he was the one who insisted that students do post-mortem exams and that they learn by doing, by actively participating in rounds, examining women in labor. So this is the setting and into this setting comes a young physician. His name, as you know, is Ignaz Stemowicz. He was born in Hungary in the city of Buda Buddha merged with the city of Pest. No bonus points for guessing the name of the new city. His father was a prosperous grocer. He started off trying to study law, but some medical student friends of his smuggled him into a dissection in a morgue. He thought it was fascinating, and he decided to go into medicine. Did his first year of medical school in Vienna. Then he did two years in Pest. Then he went back to Vienna to graduate. It made sense to graduate from Vienna. It was not only a better school, but it was a degree that would allow him to practice anywhere uh, in the Austrian Empire, whereas Pest graduates were restricted to Hungary. He took a course in logic and statistics, and he studied with medical school reformers of the day, such as leaders in pathological death. So he studied with pathologist named Karl Rokotansky, and this is the book that Rokotansky wrote, A Handbook of Pathological Anatomy. Semmelweis wanted to go into internal medicine. He kept getting turned down. So he eventually settled for going into obstetrics. And in 1844, went to work at the General Hospital as the assistant to the chair, Klein. Kind of like being chief resident today. Usually it was a ticket to a top tier job after you completed the assistant. It was a busy job. He was responsible for examining patients, doing operations, supervising tough deliveries, 
teaching the medical students, maintaining the records, helping Klein take care of his private patients. It said that once he performed 34 deliveries over a single 24-hour period, and he also continued working in the morgue as well as working on. He started out with a mistake, an impolitic mistake, one that may have played a role in what comes later in this story. The ministry had convened a formal commission to investigate the problem with childbed fever. Klein, the professor of obstetrics, told the committee that the problem was that Vienna had bad air. He was alluding to the miasmatic theory of disease. Upon hearing Klein say this, which obviously wasn't true, Semmelweis rose immediately so that he could contradict his professor before the commission and pointed out that lots of hospitals in Europe had air that was just as bad as Vienna's, but they didn't have the same magnitude of disease. Klein was not happy about being contradicted in public, and he soon developed a simmering dislike for the tactless, overly forthright young assistant he had hired. This is one of the places where politics, in this case, small p politics, personal politics, plays a role in the story, and it will continue to play a role in the story. To understand what Semmelweis did next, we need to consider the organizational structure of the department. The OB service was big. It was huge. The bed count expanded to as many as 800. And up here in the upper right, we see the wards for delivered patients. We see closely here. Um, women spent weeks in the hospital before they delivered. Uh, they had as many as almost 8,000 births a day over 20, or excuse me, 8,000 births a year over 20 a day. Since 1839, the hospital had been divided into two services, two free wards, if you will. And they alternated admissions by day into these two wards. One ward was run by doctors, the first division or the first clinic. One ward was run by midwives, the second division or the second clinic. And the hospital had been keeping detailed statistics of what happened in each ward. And here they are. Take a moment and look at this table from one of Semmelweis's publications. What do we see? Not a pretty sight. The first thing that probably strikes you is the difference between the physician's division and the midwives. We see the year, the number of births, the number of deaths, and the percentage of women who died. And we see that the physician's numbers are strikingly higher than the midwives' numbers. Sometimes twice as many. It shouldn't be that way, he thought. Why are the doctors doing so much worse? Not only that, but note the absolute magnitude of the numbers. A couple of years here, 1842 and 1846, a woman coming in to deliver a baby in the physician's ward has over a 10% chance of dying. Over a 10% chance of dying for a woman coming in to give birth. And look at the, the, the total numbers. More than one woman a day is going out of the Vienna General Hospital dead after coming in healthy to give birth. The numbers are actually worse than this because women sometimes will be transferred from the first clinic to the general hospital and that, and that never happened from the second clinic. What's going on here? We're fortunate to have evidence as to the very logical thought process by which Semmelweis sought to explain these differences. He very carefully went through the various possibilities. He said, was it miasma, what Klein said it was? He said, that doesn't really make any sense. We don't see women dying outside the hospital, which for other epidemics we do. They have the same atmosphere, um, the same air in the midwives clinic. What about overcrowding? Well, the midwives clinic was actually more overcrowded. The physician's clinic got a bad reputation, so women wanted to go 
to the midwife's clinic. What about laundry? Maybe it's dirty laundry. Well, same laundry working for both. Maybe it's fear. This was an interesting theory. When women were nearing death, they would call the priest. The priest would come to see the woman being preceded by Sakistran who rang a bell. And everybody knew that a woman was about to die. So the theory was that it's fear that causes, that's causing all these women to get sick. So Semmelweis tested this theory. If you look here at the map of the hospital down on the first floor, you see the living quarters for the priests. Up on the second floor, you see the wards for the women. So what Semmelweis did is he arranged for the priests to come via a different route. So he didn't walk through all the women. It didn't make a difference. Maybe it's because the women were already sick. They were poor. Well, that's true of the women in the midwives clinic as well. Maybe it's because there were too many students. The examinations were too rough. Each student would examine the woman after Semmelweis did. There were usually four students. That's a lot of examinations. He tried to cut that down. It didn't matter. Maybe it's the position the woman was in for labor. That didn't seem to make a difference. Semmelweis also noted patterns in the data. Extended dilation was dangerous. Women who came in and had been examined because they been, their labor had been delayed tended to be more likely to get childbed fever. On the other hand, women who had premature births were rarely affected. Women who gave birth on the street were not affected at all. You might wonder why they went into the hospital. It's because the hospital was associated with the orphanage, so they would give birth on the street, get admitted to the hospital, and their child could go to the orphanage. He looked at different patterns of illness in the two clinics. In the uh, midwife's clinic, when there was puerperal fever, it would tend to jump around from bed to bed. In the physician's clinic, it would tend often to be a row of women, two or three or four or five, who had been in beds next to each other. Two clinics, two different rates. What to make of this horrible, horrible situation? Uh, the women knew it was horrible. Patients kneeling and wringing their hands begged to be released in order, from the first clinic in order to seek admission to the second clinic. Such persons have usually been admitted because they are ignorant of the reputation of the first clinic, but they soon become suspicious because of the large numbers of doctors present. Still grounds for suspicion even today. One sees maternity patients with abnormally high pulse rates, bloated stomachs, and dry tongues, still insisting hours before death that they are perfectly healthy because they know that treatment by the physician is the forerunner. Imagine what it's like to work in this clinic. Imagine what it's like to try to figure out what's going on. As Semmelweis said, everything was in question. Everything seemed inexplicable. Everything was doubtful. The only thing that was certain was the large number of deaths. So, about this time, he, he took a vacation, went on vacation to Venice. This is not a picture of Venice when he was there on vacation. It's a more modern picture of Venice. And when he came back, he heard about a friend of his named Kolechka. Kolechka was a student of forensic medicine. And he discovered that Kolechka's finger was pricked by a student with the same knife that was being used in an autopsy, and he died of bilateral pleurisy, pericarditis, peritonitis, and meningitis. Kolechka had abscesses throughout all his major organs. The most dramatic was a large abscess residing in his left eyes, causing gross displacement of the globe. Samo, I said, the day and night I was haunted by the image of Kolechka's disease and was forced to recognize even more decisively that the disease from which Kolechka died was identical to that which, from which so many maternity patients had died. I was forced to admit that if Kolechka's disease was identical with the disease that killed so many maternity patients, it must have originated from the same cause that brought it on in Kolechka. So here we see a scientist who has written down the thought process that led him to his innovation. His key insight was that the purpural state was not a requirement. You didn't have to 
be pregnant to get childbed fever. And the key implication was this is a disease that doesn't only afflict women. So what's causing this disease? <clears throat> Semmelweis said that the problem is that we're doing the autopsies on women who have died, often from childbed fever, and then going and examining women directly from the morgue. And the cause, he said, was cadaverous particles introduced into the vascular system. Note that he did, this is not bacteria. He doesn't know about bacteria. Bacteria haven't been discovered as causes of disease just yet. But he says that's the cause. Something from the women who had been dissected being brought into the women who were still alive. And with this cause, he could explain the patterns in the data. Extended dilation was dangerous because women got examined many times. Premature births were rarely affected because if a woman came in with premature labor, she wouldn't be examined very much in hopes that her labor would go more slowly. Street births were not affected because those women weren't examined at all. The patterns of illness in the, in the two clinics, because if a physician came up from the morgue and saw women in a row in the clinic, they would all get infected, whereas it was more random in the Midwest. Two clinics, two different rates, two different findings. So what he thought was the problem was the smell. That was, and when you came out from doing autopsies on people who have died of sepsis, unsurprisingly, perhaps, your hands tended to smell. And he said that smell is the cadaverous particles, and what you needed to do was get rid of the smell. And so in May of 1847, he put a bowl of chlorine solution at the entrance to the first division uh, he had stiff brushes to get under the fingernails, and he said everybody must wash with the chlorine solution until their hands don't smell anymore. This is a dramatic recreation of the event by the artist Robert Tom, whose paintings actually hang uh, in University Hospital. If you walk around the hospital, you'll see lots of paintings that he did. This shows Semmelweis in the back. There's a woman in bed, and here you see somebody washing. Did it work? The month before he started, 18% of the women on the ward died. In the next month, May, 12% died. June, 2% died. August, nobody died. The rate spiked again in October, and then again in November. In October, Semmelweis traced the source to a woman who had a persistent drainage and therefore required attendants to wash their hands, not only when they went from the morgue to the laboring women, but between each woman. In November, he discovered somebody, another woman that had um, a drainage and isolated her. And he kept careful statistics. So let's take a look at what he found. This, uh, this is a graph that I made from his statistics. This isn't his graph. This shows maternal mortality in the first and second clinic. Uh, second clinic here in purple, first in the darker color. Percent going up from 1833 to 1839. They're about the same. Not much difference. What happens in 1839? In 1839, the medical school mandates that students must start doing autopsies on a regular basis. And what we see is immediately the maternal mortality rate spikes in the first clinic, and you see this big gap between the first and the second. And it spikes, as we've discussed, to truly frightening levels. In 1846, Semmelweis introduces chlorine hand washing and the maternally, maternal mortality rate promptly drops down to the level shown here, to no difference between the first and the second clinics. My friends and colleagues who do implementation research, who do health services research, who do any kind of clinical research, 
this kind of finding is one that would blow us away. You've got a problem. You know when it started. It's horrible. You have an intervention basically does away. Hand washing works. You should wash your hands. The story is not quite as simple as this. For one thing, the rate, as you see, has not gone down to zero. It's gone way down, but it hasn't gone down to zero. How to explain the remaining disease? Semmelweis could have concluded that residual disease was caused by other factors. Instead, he concluded that every case of childbed fever was due to the same cause and postulated that it was caused by internal invisible contamination. Here again, we encounter politics, this time big P politics. The revolutions of 1848. The University of Vienna was a hotbed of revolutionary activity. 6,000 Vietnamese students demanded academic freedom. They closed down the university. They toppled the government. And in May, successful Austrian students coalesced into their own action league, the Academic Legion, and darned revolutionary garb, donned revolutionary garb. Semmelweis sympathized with the cause of the revolutionaries. He proudly wore the Legion's conspicuous uniform. He even lectured to medical students while wearing the uniform of the rebels. His pro-establishment boss, Klein, was not a man. The revolution was not a permanent one. The concessions were all reversed. Uh, the University of Vienna, the conservative old school with its imperial connections, enjoyed a resurgence of power and influence gained at the expense of the new school and one that put the political influence of Professor Klein, the chair of OBGYN, up. This was a change that would profoundly affect the fate of Ignaz Semmelweis in his ideas about handling. A commission was proposed to study the findings. It was headed by Skoda, the professor of medicine, they left off Klein, the professor of obstetrics. Pretty obvious snub. Uh, Klein's resulting animosity was probably broader. It wasn't just towards Semmelweis. On the other hand, it's not coincidental that it was Klein who insisted that medical students examine cadavers. And it was Klein who, who had relaxed the, rest the restraints on vaginal exams. He expected to be, Semmelweis expected to be reappointed. He was not. He no longer had a job. He was offered a non-clinical position, but he couldn't continue his work. And instead, he left Vienna. He moved away to Budapest, kind of an abrupt departure, didn't even say goodbye to his friends, which offended them. He accepted a non-paying position of head of obstetrics and gynecology at St. Rocco's Hospital, down here. Uh, the maternal mortality rate when he was running this, this hospital was less than 1%, while the maternal mortality rates in Prague and Vienna were between 10 and 15%. He was also then appointed to the University of Pest and was able to reduce the mortality rate there to less than 1%. Finally, in 1860, he published his book, The Etiology, Concept, and Prophylaxis of Childbed Fever. And he sent copies to leading obstetricians all around Europe. You may be surprised to hear that the responses were almost uniformly negative. He faced fierce opposition from some of the most prominent physicians, including Rudolf Virchow. Rudolf Virchow is a pathologist who we honor for being the father of modern cell theory and the founder of social medicine. Virchow thought the chief cause was of childbed fever was inadequate uterine contraction. Other leaders countered with other ideas. Why? It may surprise you. It certainly surprised Semmelweis, who said, as living proof of my doctrine, I decreased peripheral fever mortality rates in three different hospitals by using my regimen. He was right. Why didn't people just get it? Well, let's first of all stipulate that these people were not out to kill women. Um, they weren't stupid. They weren't ignorant. Virchow made enormous progress in other areas. They, people in the 1840s were just as smart as we are today. They, we have different pieces of information and different tools, but I think it's unlikely, unlikely that the human mind has significantly evolved 
in the period since then. So I think it's useful for us today to consider why his data didn't convince them. And I think there's several reasons. One is physicians thought of themselves as paragons of virtue and cleanliness. They didn't think about themselves as walking Petri dishes. For one thing, Petri dishes hadn't been invented yet. They were offended by the idea that they were causing infections. Most of them were members of upper class families and they saw the poor as those more likely to be uh, dirty or filthy. As one said, doctors are gentlemen and gentlemen's hands are clean. But there are other really important reasons why Timowais' ideas may not have been accepted. One is he could not explain all cases. If in fact the cause was cadaverous particles taken by, by doctors from the morgue to the delivery suite, and if in fact you could get rid of the smell, then why were there still cases? What was causing them? He had no idea. He couldn't demonstrate a cause of the disease. As one critic said, it seems improbable that enough infective matter or vapor can be secluded around the fingertips to kill a patient. That's not an irrational objection. Remember that this is before the germ theory. And what this person is saying, you're telling me I can have something under my fingernail that can kill a healthy woman? What? How? Demo Weiss couldn't answer that question. They were saying, show me he couldn't. He didn't have a theory. He was asking them to understand his approach on faith. He was also asking physicians to assume an awful lot of guilt. Now, he was willing to accept that guilt himself. He'd gone thousands of times directly from the morgue to the maternity ward to examine expectant women. He realized the depth of his own guilt and he accepted it. He said, my conscience tells me that I must reprove myself as God only knows the number of those who have died as the result of my activity. Few of the obstetricians have had more dealings with cadavers than myself. However painful and distressing this fact is, there would be no sense in denying it. No, there is one remedy only to publish the truth to all those who are concerned. So he was accepting guilt. But he was also asking other physicians to assume guilt, both for the deaths they had caused and also for the system that had led to those deaths. In essence, he was blaming pathological anatomy, which many of the physicians had championed as the future of medicine. The saying pathological anatomy not only wasn't the answer to how to deal with childbed fever, but it was the cause of childbed fever. And that's a heavy load. And he didn't do it well. He became more upset, more irascible, more mad about the lack of people to accept his theories. And so he wrote a series of open letters to leaders all around Europe. His approach was highly polemical and supremely, supremely offensive. This is what he wrote to Spaeth, the head of obstetrics in Vienna. Within myself, I bear the knowledge that since the year 1847, thousands and thousands of corporal women and infants who have died would have not have died had I not kept silent. And you, Herr Professor, have been a partner in this massacre. The murder must cease. The Scanzoni, the professor of obstetrics at Würzburg, you have sent a contingent, a significant contingent of unwitting murderers into Germany. Did you not adopt my ideas? I declare before God and the world that you are a murderer. Gentis Scanzoni, you've demonstrated that in, in a new hospital like yours, a good deal of homicide can be committed. You will not escape God's. This is not a way to win friends and influence people. But his behavior got even more bizarre. He would come up to complete constrangers on the street and argue passionately for his doctrine. They would wander away, wondering, why is he talking to me? He began drinking heavily. He began uh, keeping company in the women of ill repute. At his last faculty meeting, he was supposed to report on a vacant lecturer position. Instead, he pulled out a piece of paper and started to read the midwife's code. His friends couldn't deal with him. 
he was lured to go visit a new mental institution, this institution shown here. It wasn't really a visit when he was there. He was restrained, kept there as a patient, and he eventually died in 1965. One story has it from sepsis after having been beaten by the guards. Essentially, nobody came to his funeral. And after he died, his successor at the Budapest changed his practices and the death rate from childbed fever promptly went up. In the decades to follow, things changed. One of the biggest things is we had the germ theory. We had better microscopes, stains, the stain bacteria, solid media on which to grow bacteria, such as the Petri dish. The work of scientists such as Lister, Pasteur, and Koch, experimental science, all established what we take for granted, that bacteria can cause disease. As a result, Semmelweis came to be accepted, came to be praised, even by those who had earlier opposed him. This is a statue in his honor. This is a commemorative coin that was printed in his honor. And we now see his work on hand washing as incredibly significant. We all say that we believe in hand washing. I do. Yet even well into the 21st century, with all that we know about microbes in virology, et cetera, et cetera, hand washing rates remain pitifully low. There are many studies that show this. One of my favorite was at the American Society for Microbiology, presumably people who know about the germ theory of disease. When they asked participants if they washed their hands after using the bathroom, 95% of them said yes. But when they were secretly observed, and I don't know how this got through the IRB, uh, not many did. 58% uh, of men, women, slightly better at 67%. Even in hospitals, though we know that better washing drops the incidence significantly, uh, we continue to confront inadequate levels of hand washing in hospitals. Uh, there may be a moral element. I'll just suggest there's one interesting study that showed that staff hand washing uh, between seeing patients in all intensive care units had a compliance rate of only about 54%. However, in the pediatric ICU, it was 90% and 35% in the adult ICU. Possibly there were different people in the pediatric ICU. Possibly people took better, just figured they should take better care of kids in the ICU. There's interesting work going on here at the University of Michigan about, about hands and hand hygiene. Uh, Lona Modi and her group have shown that disease carrying organisms travel in on patients' hands, so it's not just the doctor's hands that are a problem, but also the patient's hands. Got some nice publicity for their work. Uh, Sanjay Saint has done work on the importance of local leadership for implementation, both here and at several sites internationally. I assume that effective local leadership would not include publicly, publicly calling out people as murderers. In this current environment, it's clear that hand washing is important not only to protect our patients, but to protect ourselves. And it will be interesting to consider or look at whether or not this will lead to behavioral change. Uh, we are now in the midst of a pandemic in which hand washing is very much in the news. It's very much talked about. Um, there have been attempts to reference earlier hand washing. How long is the 20 seconds? that you're supposed to wash your hands. It's in happy birthday. Uh, in England, there's a wonderful poster about the way proper hand washing uh, per Lady Macbeth is that it takes about 20 seconds to repeat what Lady Macbeth says as she's washing her hands, starting with out, down, spot. And in finishing up with yet who would have thought the old man to have so much blood in him. A rather gory thing to recite, but if it takes 20 seconds and it helps you time it, why not? Or to put it a little more bluntly, I just wash your hands like you just killed the rightful king and you can't get the blood off. So 
So what I've done over the last 45, 50 minutes or so is to try to answer the question, why do we think it's a good idea to wash your hands? And I do think it's a good idea to wash your hands. I've tried to show that new ideas do not in and of themselves lead to changes in practice, nor does even good ideas and good data. Because Semmelweis certainly had good data. Uh, I think that the general lessons from this uh, hold for today and hold for almost all activities, as I suggested, all ideas start somewhere. This is where this one started. Politics matters, big P politics and little P politics matters. Uh, as we go about confronting infectious diseases, uh, both in the past and in the present. Uh, how you present the material matters. Uh, Semmelweis didn't do himself any favors uh, by calling people murderers. And finally, um, it's hard sometimes to accept data without theory. We all want to know why. Why does it work? And one of the problems with Semmelweis is that he couldn't really answer why it worked. We will, of course, move now from hand washing with soap and water to hand washing with Purell when appropriate. I want to thank Lona Modi, Sanjay Saint, and Lorraine Washer for sharing some thoughts with me about preparing this presentation. And last week, uh, my colleague Mark Fender uh, ended his talk with a picture of a rainbow taken by John Carruthers outside of his office. Uh, maybe we can start a tradition here. I guess if we do it twice in a row, it's a tradition. Uh, I like that. This is a rainbow uh, outside of a place that I vacation on a regular basis. Uh, I took this picture after a horrendous thunderstorm uh, as the skies had started to clear and this gorgeous rainbow appeared over the water. We are in troubled times. Uh, I'd like to think that the thunderstorm is starting to abate. Uh, I don't think we're quite at the end of the rainbow just yet. But uh, I think if we keep our eye focused on the notion that things can and will get better, that at the end of the day, uh, we're going to do just fine. And this hospital, this department are going to emerge from the pandemic even stronger than they were before. I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions. If you have questions, type it in the Q&A section of the video. It's on the right-hand side, the, the last uh, button on the right. Maybe I'll start off with one. So um, that was fantastic, uh, Joel. Um, any thoughts? Uh, it was hand washing just with water, or did they add substances uh, or various substances to, to wash your hands? And I don't know if you have a comment on how that has migrated over time, if it uh, has? That's, that's a great question. Um, first of all, a lot of early hand washing, the symbolic, the ritual hand washing, the religious hand washing is often done just with plain water. Uh, Semmelweis was interested in getting rid of the smell. And so he used a chlorine solution, which was probably effective at getting rid of the smell and probably effective at getting rid of the bacteria, but was awfully tough on the hands. And one of the other reasons people may not have adopted it quickly was that it tended to mess up your hands fairly well. Um, soap and water, uh, I think more of a late 19th, early 20th, 20th century phenomenon. And of course, Purell is just a whole lot more convenient. And I think whatever makes it easy for people to do is gonna make it more likely that they will do it. Whether or not the current pandemic, which is unlike anything we've ever seen, will lead people to be more assiduous in their use of soap and water, which works, I am told, just as well as or better than Purell, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, thank you, Joel. Um, so one question that's come through is, were the midwives washing hands at all when they were prior to the comparator or just touching overall, um, less touching overall on their sides? Uh, the midwives, as far as I know, were not washing their hands. Uh, the, the huge difference is, and I, I hate to be so specific this soon after what may have been lunch for many people. Um, the physicians were going down and doing three or four autopsies on people who had died of sepsis. 
cutting open abscesses, cutting open bodies, you know, that were crawling with bacteria. And then with, and they didn't wear gloves because rubber gloves didn't exist. Uh, and then they were going up and examining uh, women in labor with those same hands. So the midwives difference wasn't that they were washing their hands, they weren't doing autopsies. They were quote unquote, less well-educated. And I put that in quotes. This is one of the great ironies is it was the modern scientific advances that led the doctors to adopt a behavior that wound up in literally thousands of patients dying. Uh, thank you. Um, two other questions have come in. Um, one uh, was, did the death, why did the death rates go up in both units? I believe it was in 1842. Someone wrote 1943, but I believe it was 1842. You showed this kind of periodic up and down prior to the experiment. I was wondering, uh, if, was there a rationale for why it went up in both units uh, during the times it did? I, I don't know. Uh, it, they went up more or less in parallel. One can imagine that there were some local environmental conditions that led to more people getting infected, but I, I don't know. One question came, were there any individuals who confirmed and followed Semmelweis? People came around to him uh, some more rapidly than others. Uh, certainly, he was conf he was eventually confirmed because uh, after the germ theory of disease became widely adopted, Koch in 1882 comes up with Koch's postulates, uh, identifies tuberculosis, so the organism responsible for tuberculosis. Uh, tuberculosis at that point is responsible for one out of every seven deaths in the world. So identifying the organism responsible for it was a big deal. Um, and once the germ theory became widely accepted, then people went and looked at Semmelweis and said, well, these women were obviously dying of sepsis. Uh, they obviously had bacteria throughout their body and the physicians were carrying the sepsis into the body. So once that theory came along, I don't think there was really any any doubt. And that that, that is why today we, as I said at the outset, we more or less accept the fact that you ought to wash your hands. Um, but the, the, one of the points of, the, of, the, of this presentation was that was not immediately accepted, uh, even though there was good data to support it. All right, fantastic. Um, another question is, um, what is the leadership lesson here for us in the COVID era? Specifically, what mistakes did Semmelweis make that we should be wary of? Are there things that we should be doing differently based on his experiences during this era? Well, history ain't prophecy. I don't know if Yogi Berra ever said that. He should have. Um, but there certainly are parallels. Uh, we have seen, remember I mentioned Semmelweis early on stood up and publicly contradicted his boss uh, and set the stage for what was a fairly rough relationship. Remember, after all, after having made this enormous discovery, he got fired. I think it's just to, first of all, to realize that we do live in a world in which politics matters. And again, it's small p and big p politics. Um, I think part of leadership is that if you want to convince people to go along with what you think is a good idea, uh, you have to meet them a little bit on their turf. Um, seems fairly obvious, but calling, you know, saying, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, you're a murderer, and I declare you to be a murderer before God, which is literally what he said. Um, that's less likely to get the person convinced to do what you say than if you work in some other means to do that. Obviously, I mean, we could spend two or three hours talking about the politics of the current situation, who's in charge, when are we going to reopen the economy, who gets to decide that call, on what basis do they decide it, uh, how many deaths are there going to be, how many deaths should there be, we could go on. Uh, the point, obviously, is that good science has to be mixed in with politics, and uh, good scientists and good leaders understand that and not only work to get the science to be first rate, but also get work to get the interpersonal political interactions. Thank you. Um, I'll just sum up a couple more questions that came in. Um, you know, at the time Semmelweis was uh, alive, did he have either contemporaries or advocates? So this is not necessarily subsequent to him, but at the time when he, uh, particularly when he did these uh, um, this experiment, 
did he have other people who uh, joined him? There were other people who were concerned about purple fever. As I made the point, it was it was a huge, huge problem. And other people uh, were slowly working their way towards cleanliness as possibly being an ideology. Um, none, so far as I know, e either came up with the results like Semmelweis did or joined him in his, in his work. All right. And I'll just, uh, I'll just kind of summarize these last two questions, and this will be our last one. So one, one person uh, writes, um, it's a good lesson for medicine general. You know, sometimes things are rejected early on. Look at cholera, look at H. pylori. Um, so the, the, the other question related to that was, was the science considered settled in Simmelweis' time? If so, does, what does this imply about science today? Oh boy, we could go on and on about these. I'm, I'll be brief. Um, both great, great points. First of all, things get rejected early that eventually get accepted. Uh, you mentioned H. pylori. I forget the exact numbers, but the original description of H. pylori was submitted as an abstract to the Australian Gastroenterological Association. I'm making the numbers up, but it was something like 60 abstracts were submitted, 55 were accepted for, for presentation. The one about H. pylori was not, uh, because it was such a ridiculous idea that they did, didn't want to hear about it. And we all know how that turned out. Settled science. If there's any important lesson of history to bring away from this, it is that every generation sees some elements of science as being settled that eventually change. Uh, the revolution about localized causes of disease overturned a previous idea that disease was something that occurred throughout the body. Um, nobody thought that the, nobody saw the germ theory coming. We're all convinced that what we're doing is right. When I take care of patients, I believe I'm using good data, uh, and I, I, try, I try to use good data to make the best possible decision at the time. But there are two possibilities. One is that today on April the 17th, is it, of 2021, we've arrived at an understanding of health and disease that will never change. And that's possible. It's unlikely. The other possibility is that what we're learning today will turn out not to be true in the future. And to the trainees out there, to the students, to the residents, uh, just remember that. Stuff that you're learning today that you're going to be tested on, that's going to be on your boards, in your lifetime, and maybe not that not that far into your lifetime, uh, is going to change. And so the facts and the knowledge are going to change. And something that we now accept to be true, which is that you should wash your hands, uh, was not thought to be true. So and my final advice to everybody out there uh, in Internet land is uh, go wash your hands. I, Joe, I think that is great advice. I want to thank you for a wonderful historical perspective on why that is so important, particularly now these days. Um, I think the, uh, there's, there's great history lessons there, um, and particularly your answer to the last question. I want to really thank you for giving grand rounds, particularly on a relatively short notice, and um, uh, a very informative grand rounds. So thank you very much, and uh, you guys have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Right.